Camp Pros, this is Oliver Gregan, Summer and Family Camps Director at YMCA Camp Jewel. Hey folks, my name is Matt Hansberger and I'm the Executive Producer of Podcasting at Go Camp Pro and you are listening to First Class Counselors. This is a series for the camp directors to give to their council, uh, counselor, uh, we're just going to start this again. Yeah, no know. problem. It's all good. <clears throat> all right. Hello, Camp Pros. This is Oliver Gregan, Summer and Family Camps Director at YMCA Camp Jewel. And I'm Matt Hansberger. I'm the executive producer of podcasting at Go Camp Pro, and you are listening to First Class Counselors. This is a series for camp directors to give to their counselors as they hire and prepare them for the upcoming summer. So share our story. Camp counselors, you are superheroes, and that's why we do this podcast, because um, how great would it be if you had all the skills of a pro counselor, even though it was your first year or second year of counseling? Um, we do this show so that campers will love their counselors, and they'll want to come back to camp year after year. Yep. So on the show, we cover one specific topic each time, and we cover the essentials as fast as we can. Like we say, it's the need to knows. The can't go without. The fundamentals. The basics. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about being a great co. When you come to camp, you're going to be paired up with another counselor and an entire staff team. You're going to be a power team, hopefully, after listening to our podcast. But today is all about supporting your support. How can you help them be the best co they could be for you? So some camps, you may have a different co every week. Sometimes you might have them all summer. Sometimes you will have a co in a program and other times it's just in the cabin or for a moment uh, while you're trying to get something done at camp. But being a great co means your campers, your co and yourself are all going to have a better summer. Yeah, we're doing this episode because um, no matter what it looks like at your camp, you know, maybe you have, uh, like Oliver said, maybe it's, it's a, a co-counselor the whole time. Maybe it's you plus a, a counselor in training, um, but you work with people a lot. And, you know, the camp job in general, it's hard. It's not easy. But working and living with those same people week after week, that's harder, I think at least. And this isn't a group project at school where you can just like, tough it through the one month you're working on that book report, you might have two whole months with these people. So we are doing this episode. So that time is, is a not painful, but B is great because Oliver and I are both lucky that we have met some amazing lifetime friends because of camp. And um, we wouldn't be friends with those people if we hated working with them. Right. So that's why we're doing it. So we hope you enjoy this episode and um, that it helps you, uh, make those kind of long lasting friends that we know can be made at camp. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if you learn how to work better with your co-counselor, they're your first practice spouse. They're going to teach you how to be a better <laughs> partner. And that way you can have a happier life for a much longer time than just the two months of summer. So pay attention really close because there's going to be some tricks here that you can use just in any friendship that you have in the world. So uh, Matt, to get us started, our first topic is going to be about supporting the mental, emotional, and physical health of your co. Do you have any tips or tricks to start us off right now on helping our co out in their triangle of needs? Yeah, for sure. I think, I think that, um, the reason we started with this because these are the kind of questions that you want to ask or the things you want to get to know about your co um, before you start working with them. Because, you know, if, if it's like Wednesday and you don't know some of these things and that's like Wednesday is the middle of your week, it could be too late. So some of the questions I like to ask my co when I was a counselor, I said, like, what part of the day uh, do you have the most energy? Are you like, a, are you a morning person? Or are you a night person? Um, what do you feel like that afternoon slump usually? Or are you, do you have high energy there? Because maybe um, if Oliver and I are co's, I am a, a night owl. I, I do my best work at night. And if Oliver is an early bird, then that's great. Then maybe Oliver can take some more responsibilities in the morning with some of that stuff where he needs to have that higher energy. And I can do some of the planning in the morning or the things that take a little less energy. Um, and I'll, along the energy line, I'll give you my second question here is um, like, how do they take their coffee? Or what do they put on their cereal? Or uh, what, are, how, what does the perfect camp salad look like for them? Um, if you can start to get to know those kinds of things, you can like help accomplish their physical needs um, in that way. So I have some more questions, but Oliver, you were going to talk about some more like personality stuff uh, about them, how to support them. 
Yeah, I do love your point about trying to figure out more about them. Something I find really important with your co is there's an adaptability that you need to have, right? You and your co are not gonna be the same person, but you're also gonna be different people. So being able to adapt to cover the responsibilities, I think is really important. And I love your note about who's a morning person, who's a night owl, how can you make that dynamic work? Mm -hmm. And getting to know your co is really important. So I'm gonna talk to you through a few things that you can start to do to start to get to know them a little bit better. The first is something we've mentioned on the show before is called wellies. This is where you kind of pair up with somebody else and you make sure you're taking care of their physical well-being, their mental and emotional well-being. You're just kind of there to cover those daily things. It's uh, practiced at a few camps and it's always been recommended. So it's something that I know that I want to try. But take a minute and figure out who could be your wellie when you come to camp, whether camp mandates them and has them or whether you're finding them on your own. It's really important. The next thing is, Get to know the people that you're working with, right? So something at camp that we've used in the past and I think is a fantastic foundation is the five love languages. Um, this is a way to show or find how someone receives appreciation. So uh, there are five of them total. We've talked about it on previous shows, but you can take a look. Uh, we'll leave uh, them in the link of our show notes so you can check them out. It's a great way. Also, it's just knowing how they work. So some other sources that you can use to get to know them a little bit better are True Colors or their Meyer Briggs score. Um, so you know what they are. I actually just took Myers Briggs the other day and I found out that I am an ENTJ and I have been for a very long time. It hasn't changed. So it's a pretty consistent test that I think I took for the first time about 10 years ago. So um, that's, that's so cool. Oliver, we are the exact opposite. I'm an INFP. Um, so, so that's why we're doing this show, man. We cover all the bases. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Matt, do you want to take a couple more? Yeah, I also wanted to um, to give a shout out to the creator of Wellies. Um, Oliver and I have talked about Wellies a bunch uh, off the podcast too, about how they could work at, at Camp Jewel. Um, and that's a Beth and Travis Allison. So the camp hackers themselves um, came up with Wellies and Wellies are short for wellness partners. Um, and they are an awesome tool that we could, um, if you have any questions, send us an email and we can give you some more info about those. Um, other, I have some more questions that I would ask to my co's. Um, one of them is, uh, how do they like to get feedback? So, you know, if, um, if they're struggling with something or something goes badly or you have a suggestion, how can you give that to them that they'll receive it the best? So, you know, I might share my, my way is that like, I appreciate to be supported publicly and told privately how I can be better. And I'm okay to take that blunt feedback as long as it's in private. I don't like being embarrassed in front of others. Some people, surprisingly, very different than me, don't mind being called out or corrected in public. Um, obviously, sometimes you have to be, but um, yeah. So getting to know that off the start, that'll help you when it comes to keeping each other accountable, which is something we'll talk about later. Um, the other thing that I would ask them is, uh, what does stress look like? from them. So when you're stressed, when you're not at your best, whether, whether that be physically stressed or mentally stressed, what does that look like and how can I help? Um, and that might be a hard question, but if you get used to asking that question, that becomes a, a culture at your camp, that'll feel pretty normal. And um, so, you know, I could say to Oliver that like, if I am, if I am way up in my emotions and like I'm super bubbly, that means I'm probably actually tired. Um, or, you know, if I, you can read it on my face when I'm stressed, so you'll be able to see, don't worry. That's what, I, what, that's what Oliver might find out about me. So then he knows that information when we're working together for the rest of the week. Oliver, I'll throw it back to you. Yeah. Uh, so I just have, uh, two more points that I say, and that is one, just make sure you give your co a time to breathe, right? Um, don't let them shoulder everything that's going on. So make sure that they do have the time to walk away and take the moments they need. And if they're working for their hour off or if they're trying to stay in the cabin every single night, sometimes they uh, need that time to breathe. Now, some are different. And like Matt was saying, everyone operates a little bit differently. I know that when I was a counselor, my way of breathing was actually spending time with my campers where nothing was expected from me, right? Where I could play a card game with them or play a basketball game or caca and I didn't have to do it. Because um, that was something that was really important to me for my well-being. The next thing is something that lets you understand your counselors a little bit better that you're working with is the Make My Day book. And I will put the uh, link for what I have here at Camp Jewel in the show notes. 
so that Matt can post that for everybody. Mm -hmm. But the Make My Day book is really just a series of questions that let you get to know your counselor a little bit better. Better Here at Jewel, we take that book and we have it by our sign-out sheet for whenever camp or, or counselors leave camp. That way they can uh, see what something that their co might need in order to have a better day. So when they're on their time off, they might stop at Walmart and pick up a candy or something small to show their appreciation. Awesome. And I got one more for you. I, again, this is a question that I ask is what's something that they liked or didn't like about their co in previous weeks. And it's not calling people out or, you know, what frustrated you or what, what was great about working um, with a staff in past weeks and you don't need to even share specific names. But if I find out that Oliver had a co in the past week that made him the perfect cup of coffee in the morning um, one day, then I have that in my memory bank of that. I can help him out with that. I shouldn't just use coffee. I know some camps don't, don't have coffee, but you know what I mean? The perfect salad. That's, that's, that's a better one for me. <laughs> okay. All right. So then as we're moving along, we're going to talk a little bit about supporting your co in their big moments. So sometimes at camp, some big things happen or a co might have a chance to do something special and you could be there to support them or help them out. Um, also, it might be an area that's not like a big moment on stage, but maybe it's helping a camper with an issue or helping another counselor, you know, work through something and they can be there to support another or to fix the solution. So these big moments are really important for you to be the backup, be the support for them. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you can be there to help. So uh, Matt, do you have one that you really enjoy to show? Yes. So for me, when it comes to supporting your co uh, in their big moments, one thing I would say is just to, first of all, be the best audience member. So if they're up there leading a song or a game or something like that, I want to be a role model of what good listening looks like, because then I'm giving them my full attention, right? If I'm looking at them and like nodding my head, that's great. I'm giving them that positive feedback and, and showing them through my actions that I'm here for them. Second, um, you want to make sure that you are positioning yourself within the campers and you are dealing with kids who are talking. And sometimes that's as simple as just sitting, moving your location and like sitting behind them or sitting beside them. They'll get the picture. They know why you're there. Um, and they, that'll usually stop the conversation. And if it doesn't, then it's just that quiet conversation to the campers saying, hey, you know, we want to make sure we're listening so we hear all the rules or, you know, we want to be respectful to the person that's leading. Um, and that, that will, that will help them. Right. And the last thing I would say is that, um, I think of this as like leading a game or something like that. Um, something that's frustrating to me is when I'm explaining the rules of a game and I haven't finished yet. And a staff member wants to ask that really helpful leading question. Right. So, so if they say, well, Hey Matt, what happens if I tag someone at the same time? And when like, clearly I was getting to that, um, that you don't want to disrupt their flow as a leader. If they miss a piece of important information that like needs, needs, needs to be said, hopefully them as a game leader will ask, is there anything I've missed? And then that's when it's your time to chime in or just wait till the very end. So both, basically it's just be the best listener, be the best audience member. Um, and that's one of the best ways you can support them. Yeah, I have a couple, and some of them are actually ones that Matt taught me, but uh, one of the ones I do love is the secret sign language. This is coming up with some type of way to communicate with your co what they need in that moment in a non-vocal way. Uh, <clears throat> this could be putting your hand on your chin for saying, I've got this. This could be um, putting your fingers to your temple saying, I need some help here, or I need an idea. Uh, this could be, you know, even something as simple as scratching your head and that means I need a minute, right? Talk to your co and figure out what your secret language could be because you might wanna come up and help them or they might need your help and you need to communicate that way in an effective way. And in those big moments, they look cooler because they didn't need to outright say they need your help in front of everybody. They got it because you guys had pre-established a norm. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> The next thing is, Matt kind of alluded to this, you know, take care of the campers. You know, if they're having that big moment on stage or if they have that chance right there and then, or, you know, maybe they're helping that camper who needs a little bit of extra time, you could take care of the rest of the campers and handle it and let them have their moment that they need in order to be impressive, be who they gotta be. 
uh, and then buy into that big moment that they're having because this is their moment. You know, you want to be able to help them out. You know, give them that positive feedback for it. <clears throat> and talking about that positive feedback, you don't need to be negative. If they just had their big moment and you're going to be talking to them afterwards, keep it to positive stuff, right? Let them know, oh, I really loved when you did this. I really loved when you did that. That was fantastic here. If it wasn't great, they probably know. Or if something went wrong, they probably know. So instead of being negative and saying, oh man, that was great until you da 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 da, uh, give them the feedback that says something along the question of like, oh man, that was great. Is there anything that you wanted to change or fix about it? And then that way, the thing that they already know went wrong is still coming out of their mouth. They're analyzing themselves. They're learning about what they did wrong. And then if there is something that really needed a blank filled in, you can tell them after that entire conversation or at the end of it, because at the very end, you still listen to them. You let them analyze themselves and you're now truly helping and giving constructive criticism. You're not going right for their jugular about what they did wrong in the first place. And you can pretty much always find a positive in something. So go for it. And then finally, just say yes to their big moment. If they're pitching an idea to you and you think, eh, maybe, or if you're like, oh, that's great, say yes. Give them that you know, empowerment to do something great. Unless it's something unbelievably horrible, don't say no to it. Don't crush their dreams right there. And then, because they might be onto something really good and you just can't imagine what they're imagining in their head. So give them their moment. They'll probably make it work because they're obviously passionate about it. So let them have that. Give creative creativity power. Yeah, I, I think that if you are saying, even if they come up with an idea that you're not sure about, the simple statement of tell me more, or, tell me more about that, like that sounds really cool. And then you could ask questions like, what do you think would happen if, or what if, rather than shutting down their idea, you're giving them that opportunity to explain themselves more. And, and maybe, maybe you just didn't understand their original idea. And then Oliver, I would say the one thing that really resonated with me that you said was that giving them space and giving them time to shine. I think one of the nicest things you can say to your co is like, Hey, I know this is really important for you. Or, or even if it's not just saying, I've got this, like I've got, I've got the kids go do what you need to do. And I'll see you back in a little bit. Um, that, that is one of the best ways you can support them period, not just in their big moments, I would say. Um, so let's talk a little bit about when we need to keep our co's accountable. So this, is a really delicate, delicate subject because at a certain point, you are going to be the one who's giving them that feedback. You are going to be the one who needs to make sure they're doing their responsibilities because it affects you as well, right? Holding each other accountable is extremely important and it is probably the most difficult conversation you're going to have as a co. So we're going to dive into this. And one of the things we really want to emphasize is empathy, is really trying to see it from somebody else's perspective. So as we go through this, try and put this into your head of, you know, if you're holding someone accountable, there might be some tension already. So how can we, A, prep ourselves for this so that we can front load maybe some things that we need to be accountable for? And then at the end of the day, how do we give each other feedback and making sure that we are holding each other to the standards that we're setting? So Matt, can you kick us off with how you might keep a co accountable? Yeah, and I said it before, and you just said it there, I don't think we can say it enough, is the more you decide what that feedback and what that accountability system looks like at the start, the better off you'll be. Um, and then just giving time, my, my first tip is just giving time to keep each other accountable. Because it's hard to do that in the, the day to day because you don't want to call someone, maybe they don't want to be called out publicly and it, it doesn't feel great to do that in front of your campers. So my first tip is porch talks. We called these porch talks because all the cabins at the camper I grew up at had a nice a decent sized porch and it was our responsibility that after the kids were put to bed after we did whatever roses buds and thorns or whatever you do with them that you and your co before anyone goes on night off would sit together and you would talk about your day and it, it, it can be as simple as going through the day and you could ask like what their rose bud and thorn was um, but a really powerful question that you can ask is is there anything that I can do to start uh, anything that I can start, stop, or continue? Or is there any way that I um, can be a better co for you? And that vulnerability will open up that conversation a little bit. And maybe they might not give you anything and that's okay. Um, but I also think 
Um, if you establish at the start of the week saying like, hey, during our porch talks, like I really do want to hear that feedback. Um, and I, and I want to be able to give you that. Is that okay with you? And then you've started that, you know, intention and, and you said front loading, my favorite, um, my favorite F word in the world, Oliver is front loading. And you have set that up, um, with good intention. And I think the porch talk is like, you're like, at least every day you're finding that specific time. Maybe it's during rest hour or however it works for your camp. Maybe if you're both early birds, you do it in the morning, who knows? Um, but I've never never had a bad experience um, having a porch talk before, so yeah. Uh, we talked a little bit about how important it is to understand the love language and you know maybe what type of personality you're working with, with Myers-Briggs or True Colors, but something that I like to bring up is sometimes you're dealing with people, or not dealing with, but you're working with people who are qualitative or quantitative, and try and think about what you might be. So somebody who's a quantitative is a more logical-based thinker. We're thinking about how we can measure things, what are specific actions we see in order to justify something. I am very much a quantitative thinker. I like to measure that way because I see behavioral evidence behind what happens there. However, I might get a co who's more of a qualitative person. So somebody who can work off of feelings and the general nature of things and has a better idea of what's going on with the flow in the daily camp day. How does, you know, how do our campers feel right now? Mm -hmm. Right? That's something that you know, maybe a quantitative person might struggle with where a qualitative person is much more aware of. So when you're holding somebody accountable, it's really important to understand how they are measuring things in the cabin. Because for me, if you come up to me with a checklist of things that say, hey, did we make sure that all of our campers showered today, that all of our campers got to their activities on time, that they got their medications, like I will have that checklist and I will be making sure that all of those things happen. I am a quantitative <laughs> person. And holding me accountable is by very easy. You can even see, I'm sitting at my desk right now. And if you're watching our YouTube, you can see my lists. List here, list here, another list here, another list here. I have lists all over the place that I use as my form of checks and ba balances because when I check something off my list, that is a quantitative way of knowing. Mm. However, my friend, or a co might be a qualitative person, which means that while I'm checking off my list, somebody else is trying to feel how somebody else is feeling mm. and being more empathetic to what's going on and understanding that something didn't get checked off of this list because they may have been tired. They may, their feelings might've been hurt during soccer that day. They are on top of this. And if you are a counselor who is working, you need to understand what's your measurement style and how do I work with somebody who might have a different measurement style than me? And can we make this work somehow where I can get a, for me, a logical measurement and they can get a qualitative measurement from me. And it's a real struggle sometimes. Uh, and we'll go, I'll get into that a little bit more, but let me let Matt take over for a second because I think you got the basic idea of the difference between those two. Yeah, I love that. That's funny, Oliver. I think we would be like really cool opposite counselors to each other because I am all qualitative. I, I, I like lists. I like lists too, but um, I worked with someone who was very uh, qualitative, quantitative as well. And, and um, they were like, I just don't get all of like the, the feelings thing. It's not that they didn't understand feelings, but we literally put feelings on a checklist for them, like, is everyone in our cabin feeling great? And yeah. and they were like, look at me, I'm being qualitative. And I was like, that's great. Um, so I, I'm sure on one of Oliver's many checklists, uh, there were a lot of check marks beside those too. So good job, look at you for accomplishing Thank your you goals. Yeah. Um, the, so what I wanna kind of get into now is, uh, like a, the stickier situation is like, if you need to give feedback, um, to that person. Um, first of all, let's, let's make sure we say what we say on every episode is that follow your camp's policies, right? So there's going to be ways that if things need to go to your camp director and, and there might be like a culture at camp of like what does need to go to your director versus what can just be said to your co. Um, there's a couple of things here. One, I have this personal belief that if you do co-evaluations or if they're going to get a piece of feedback on their evaluation, even if it's through that you've passed on to a director, I really feel strongly that you should that, that should be discussed with them first. And sometimes that's on the director to discuss it with them and, and give them a chance to improve. But if you can give them that data early, they might not like hearing all of those things all the times, right? You as a good co 
we're going to tell you to receive that feedback well. But if, if they don't take it well, they'll have at least some time to process that if you do it early enough. But it feels kind of crappy if I get, um, if I'm Oliver's co and Oliver tells me that like I didn't, I wasn't the first to wake up once, but I don't hear about that until the last day. Then like I have no opportunity to make that better. Right. And, and, and then I'm getting a negative evaluation from my camp director on something that I could have easily fixed because I didn't realize that I was doing it. Right. The next thing that I would say is that if you're going to the, to the point of talking to one of your head staff about a co, I think, I think that it's okay to do that. I would think that when you do it, there's two things you should keep in mind. Um, the first is that you should be very clear about like, I don't, I'm not here to get them in trouble. I'm here to look for advice. Um, and because that's going to look good, it looks good on you that you're not just complaining. Um, and you don't want to get somebody in trouble. You just want to work better with them. Right. And if, and you maybe don't feel comfortable with your co at that point, or, or you just want some advice. Your head staff is the person to do that with. One thing I, I didn't say that I should, this isn't something to, to complain to your co counts to your other co counselors about that's a, we take it up, not out kind of mentality. And the second thing is that you should have already tried something first. A good director, the first question, um, if it, it, when I was a camp director, if somebody came to me with a problem, the first question I almost always ask is, okay, what have you already done? Because then I at least know that you've tried. Um, so it looks good on you if um, A, you say, I'm just looking for some help, and B, this is what I've already tried. Yeah. I have a note for that later, but I'll skip to it really quickly. Yeah, yeah. That checklist for me being a quantitative person uh, <laughs> is, <laughs> sorry, now I'm stuck on it. But uh, it's okay. so I have that checklist. And to be honest, we try to teach our campers how to solve problems on their own. Mm. So you need to be a good representative of this. Your, camp, your campers do not need to see you having these conversations with your co-counselor, but yeah. you need to be having them with your co-counselor. So you are practicing your own ability to work with other people and problem solve. So my checklist that I kind of go through as a camp director and as the quantitative person that I am, I say, A, has I, have I actually said something specific to this person about how I feel about what's going on? Have I brought it up one-on-one -on -one with them in a way that is constructive and beneficial to the two of us? Mm -hmm. uh, the next is, do we make an agreement to change something afterwards? Because if you're not willing to change something that's causing a problem, then you're not fixing the problem. You've just addressed it and that's great, but that's only gonna frustrate people because you're not doing anything to stop it from frustrating people in the future. And if anything, if your co wasn't aware of the frustration you were having in the first place, now they're probably getting frustrated at you because they didn't know this was a problem. And now because there's no solution, you haven't made an agreement for change, you're gonna go down a road of continuing to become frustrated at each other. And then finally, have you followed up if there was a lack of a change? So if you made that agreement for change and now it's been a couple of days or you as a quantitative person have measured that the change has not occurred over the course of time, which you have on your graph, uh, <laughs> then it is time to go and talk to your supervisor because you have made marketable tries to tr make a change happen for the benefit of your team of you and your co and for your campers who are probably now starting to have a negative experience because you and your co have not come to an area where you can start creating solutions. Plus your supervisor will thank you because at the very end of the day, you are doing something on your own to try and solve it first, just like Matt was saying. So, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> now with that being said, Matt, do you have another point because, um, about keeping counselors accountable? Yeah, this, I say yes, but it's also kind of because I have this, this tip that I wanted to give, but it doesn't like, it kind of falls into this, but, um, what I, I'll just say it first, then you listeners can decide where this fits in the conversation. Um, keeping each other accountable is keeping yourself accountable too. And, and what I mean by that is that um, you need to like check your own baggage first, right? Check that you have done everything you can before, um, like, am I being the most accountable and am I helping the most that I can um, is a great place to start. So one way that you can do that is just making sure you're doing all the jobs. And what I mean by that is that you're not always being the person um, to like go, go and set up a program uh, or go and, and like set up something fun and leaving your co with the campers. Um, and you might be like, 
I'd never do that, Matt, but I did as a counselor. I was so like excited about this idea that I had and I didn't even like check in with my co. I was, I was just like, Hey, I have this idea and I'm going to go and do this. Are you okay to hang back with the kids? And I don't even think I waited for their answer. Like, I think you just went and set it up and the kids thought it was super fun. And my co gave me feedback that night in our porch talk. They're like, like, dude, where were you? Like you, you were gone for a lot of the time because you were setting up that thing. And I was like, but the kids loved it. And they're like, yeah, but I was stuck with the kids the whole time. And that can be frustrating because maybe you don't love every single camper all the single time while you're at camp. Um, but even when it comes to like, are you always the person on, um, is your co always the person that has to serve food or, um, Think about those crappy jobs. Like, am I doing bathroom supervision or am I doing the, the nightly devotion all the time or are they doing it all the time? If you make sure that you're doing the fun stuff and the not so fun stuff, right? We're not running into a, like a fun parent, non-fun parent situation, right? Where you're, the, the kids are going to love you more than your coat. They should like you equally. Um, and that can be hard sometimes. But if you do that, then you're keeping yourself accountable um, and not running into that problem with a co and that's a great piece of feedback to give them right um because they might not know um so some of my specific hints here are going to be probably more lenient towards our list people uh now that i'm thinking about it all the time <laughs> um but let's go through some of those things that you can start to do to hold each other accountable so the first thing is matt and i talked about front loading a lot of camps will, on that very first night, you'll sit down with your cabin and you'll go through what are the rules of our cabin going to be? What are our areas that we're going to focus on our codes, our conduct for me and you and for everybody in this cabin? That's really important to have and that's why we do it on the first night because we all live together. Do the same thing with your co. Have an agreement between you and them. What's the expectation going to be between the two of us? And as a quantitative person, I'm going to say, make it pretty specific. Say, who's where and when, you know, who's covering the cabin on Tuesday night, who's covering it on Thursday night, or how are we going to make that decision when it comes time may even be a better way to do it because then at the very least you have a decision-making contract as well. So you guys can make smart ethical decisions when the time comes. So have that agreement between the two of you before campers even arrive. So you're on the same page for most of the issues that are going to come up when camp comes or a way to make a decision for when an issue does come up. Um, that list can also include a checklist of some daily responsibilities you might have. So whose daily responsibility is it to handle this? Now, if your co goes on their time off, obviously you pick up the responsibility, but if you have that daily checklist, then no one's going to get angry that, oh, I'm the one who's cleaning the toilet in the cabin every single day, or I'm the one who has to watch the campers every single day at siesta. If you have those daily responsibilities, you have previously agreed that this is what you're going to handle every day. You're always going to go and grab the mail after lunch. That's just what you're going to do because that way we won't forget it. The great part about having this checklist when that conversation comes up about responsibilities not being handled is you have a checklist in the first place. But also, if responsibilities are becoming too much, you can say, hey, look, I think I overshot with what I could handle. I'm getting a little overwhelmed. Is it okay if we exchange some of these responsibilities so that it's not as difficult on me? That's huge. Being able to do that and come to your co, who's probably getting frustrated that you're not handling your responsibilities, mm -hmm. is going to be a lot happier that you're, you know, not fessing up, but acknowledging the fact that things are getting a little difficult. And it, and it shows that you, that you trust them, right? Enough to, yeah. to come to them and be like, listen, I need your help. Um, I, think, I think I've got this and I need your help are two really vulnerable and hard things to do sometimes. But um, I think that'll only make your like, relationship as a co even better. And it's very similar to an idea that we've talked about in the past, which I call the Benjamin Franklin theory or the Benjamin Franklin idea, where you're asking for small favors or you're asking for favors that help build that relation between you because mm -hmm. this person is now helping you and they feel like they are somebody that you need in their life and people love to feel needed. And also you get the help and your bond is going to become stronger. So my last couple of points that I want to make about holding each other accountable is the conversation and how you have it. So the first thing is when you have that conversation, if your co is trying to hold you accountable to something, don't try to defend yourself. They're obviously frustrated about something or they're aggravated and they feel a need to bring something up. Accept their feedback. You may not agree with it. That's totally fine. 
And if you don't agree with it, you don't have to say, no, you're wrong, and then to defend yourself. Because you're just going to take two people who are now elevated, and you're going to continue to elevate it. it. You're creating a bad situation for yourself where you're just having an argument. If you realize that you're not going to agree with them right off the bat, you can say, thank you for your feedback. I want to take your advice, but I want to think about it first. Is that okay? And that gives you the opportunity to really think about the information, digest it, and see, are they right? Maybe not. Maybe if I come back to them, I can say something along the lines of, hey, I really thought about it, what you said, and I don't want you to feel like I'm disregarding it. I just feel a little bit differently about it. And then explain why. It's so important to explain your why. But with this being said, you accepted their feedback in the first place. And I think people are a little bit more understanding to that nature rather than the instant, no, I have to defend myself right now. This isn't correct. Mm -hmm. um, can I, what I I'll just jump in quickly. I think a fair question that you can ask if you don't quite understand their feedback, you, you, a fair question is like, can you tell me about a time when I did that? Like, right. If maybe if someone, if we're going qualitative, quantitative, maybe someone needs that specific example. Um, and I think, uh, I think when, if they haven't given you that example, like a good I feel statement, right, of when you did this, it makes me feel this, which is great, it's what you should give to someone when you're giving feedback. If they didn't give you that, it's okay to ask for it because maybe that example, maybe that'll give them a different perspective and you could explain why. It's not defending yourself as such, um, but it's asking for some specific context that will help you. And then you probably won't make that mistake again twice when in that situation again. And if you're a more qualitative person, my last piece of advice for you is if you see that your co might be getting frustrated and you might not know why, or you might even know exactly what it is, have that chance to go and ask them and say, hey, what's making you upset? You know, you're already a natural feel type of person. So you might get this a little bit earlier. Even if you're a quantitative person, it's if you get this, go and ask. But mm -hmm. ask your co first before they come to you with it and ask them, hey, did I do anything that's bothering you? And is there anything I can do to fix it? Yeah. Uh, if you're going to them first, then you're taking that leap that they may not feel comfortable about, that they might sit on for a day or two or for a time that makes it even worse where it comes to a point where it's almost even impossible to have a conversation about it. So try to be that conflict, try to get that conflict resolution in as fast as you can. All right. Now, Matt, <laughs> I got a really good question for you. Okay. How do you handle the moment that you hate your co? Oh, man. Yeah, it happens, man, right? Like you're not always – one thing I say about camp is that you are not always going to like everyone that you work with, but at the end of the day, you have to love and respect them, uh, right? So – um, I think, I think that feeling of like, I hate my co, like, I, I don't know, that hasn't really happened to me. I've had moments where I was frustrated with my co with things that they did. Um, but I think when I was a younger camp counselor, that was all emotion and no logic. So maybe this will help you bring some, um, some logic into it. So f what I, what I would say first is when you, the moment you feel like that is the moment to go inward for a second and check on your own biases. So I have a couple statements that I've learned from um, Brene Brown and some other really much smarter than me people about checking your own biases. So Brene Brown would ask, what is the story about the situation you're telling yourself? So the story, if Oliver and I are in conflict, I might say, oh, man, like Oliver is doing this thing like specifically to make me upset or like he, he, he just doesn't, or like Oliver doesn't care about um, if the kids are even having fun. He just wants to be the boss of them. And I can be like, okay, well that's a story. That's not, doesn't necessarily mean it's the true story. And it's probably not because the second thing I would say is we want to always work with the assumption that people are doing their best. And they, that's that idea of positive intent that they're just, they're trying their best and they want the best. That's why they're at camp. If we start with that, that can really like diffuse some of those things, some of that, that quote unquote hate, if you will. Um, and the last thing is if they're doing something that makes you upset, it, remember I worded that very specifically they're doing something that makes you upset. They're not doing something to make you upset, right? They might just not know how, how, what they're doing, how you're interpreting it. Um, and, and that's when it opens the door to a, a conversation using the, I feel statement, right? When you did this, I feel like this, but only after you've checked your biases, because, um, I think that will, 
that will stop a lot of things and stop that moment of hatred before it even fuels into a fire. What would you say, Oliver? Man, uh, <laughs> you have a lot of my points too. It, it's so true. And I think with the story aspect, it is so important for you to take that moment and understand why they're doing something and what's their thinking behind it. If you do that, then you get a better understanding of what their actions are for. And I have always lived by the saying of the only time you see a villain is in comic books. There's legitimately, I, I don't think anyone in the world who is doing something that they think is evil. Everyone mm -hmm. thinks that they are doing something that is for the greater good. Even if we look at somebody who we, I mean, most of the world agree is an evil person, they in their heads, for the most part, are thinking that they're doing the right thing. Hmm. So you need to take that moment. And although you might not agree with what they're saying, you need to see what their perspective is. What is their story, like Matt was saying? And then you've got to figure out how you're going to work with this. You know, how can you get your job done if you do disagree? Uh, and have that understanding that summer camp is you know, a very short period of time. For some people, it's a couple of weeks. For some people, it's eight, eight weeks. For some people, it's 10, but it is just the summer. So yes, you're going to be working with this person. It's going to be a difficult situation, but I can guarantee you no one, is, no one coming to summer camp is an evil villain unless they are playing a character on stage for fun. <laughs> so understand what their actions are and why they're coming from that. Now, the fact that you hate your co, understand that you're angry. You're at an elevated point. Take the time to cool down. Mm. Find a time where you can walk away from it. Find a time where you can vent to the proper person about it. And try and see if somebody else can give you a perspective that you're not willing to see because you are so frustrated, right? I have a fantastic friend who is not affiliated with camp. And I go to them. I talk to them about somebody who I might be struggling with. And they are able to give me a perspective about why that person is feeling that way. And this person is great, by the way because they don't just ask me how I'm feeling. They ask how that person that I'm angry at feels, mm. right? What are they thinking about? And it gets me thinking about their story that I might not be able to see when I'm so angry at my co. And the last thing that I'm going to leave you with is something that my mom taught me when I was really, really young. And it's something that I've always lived by up until uh, forever now. Um, but if you hate somebody, that means you're giving them enough attention and enough focus and enough of your time that you would give to somebody that you love. And if you hate something so much, you must actually truly love it because you care so much about it. And as a young kid, I didn't quite understand that because if you hate something, if I hate broccoli, then how do I actually love it? And with that case, it's a little different. You could just hate broccoli. <laughs> but, but with people, you sometimes find that your greatest frustrations are the things that you find your goals most in. Right? Mm. Something that I love about my job as a summer camp director is how much work and focus I have to put into it in order to be successful at it. Right? It is a long, arduous process, and the struggles are typically what I hate but also love about my job because they make me stronger because of it. And when it comes to people, you are going to find that this is sometimes the same situation. The person that you're struggling with the most, the person that you feel like you might hate, might be the person who's giving you the greatest gifts while you're at work. So think about that mm. when you're working with them. Who yeah. is the person that you hate that you actually kind of truly love because they're making the best you possible? Right, or maybe they're teaching, they're teaching you something out of that, right? They might make you frustrated, but you learn something about yourself along the way. I think um, something that you said, Oliver, that, that got me thinking was you're like, well, you know, camp, camp is, is short. It's, you know, it's, it's only a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Um, and let's remember why we're here right? You are here for the campers and those campers might only be at camp for one week. They might wait their whole year and scratch those days off their calendar. And when they get to camp, the last thing they want to see is the two of you fighting, right? You need to appear to your campers as a united front with your co. And so in public, you need to always be building them up. And we said it before, but settle your disagreements elsewhere. That's why the porch talks for me are, are, are critical here. Um, the other thing that I would say is don't try to be the favorite. Um, right? I think I, I even said this before, but it's worth in this situation. If you don't like your co, one way that you might subconsciously take it out on them is to try and get the campers to like you more, but that's not helpful in this situation either because you don't, you don't want, you want a camper's experience to be great and you don't want the camper's experience to just result, revolve around you as one person. You want them to go back and tell your, tell their parents that I had 
two amazing counselors. Not that I had one counselor and then one who got mad at me all the time, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to finish up with our last topic here of just how do you support the rest of your coworkers every day? What are some random tips that you can do to help your co or maybe some of the other people around camp as a whole to make just camp function better? Uh, so Matt, hit me with it. All right. As usual, we've taken a small topic and talked a long time about it. So we'll, we'll try and be fast going through these last little ones. My first piece of advice is something that I kind of live by is set the farthest table first. And that's just the mentality that I have of making um, it easier for, for future you and others. So if I'm on a dish team or if I'm on a setting the table team, for instance, I'm going to walk, I'm going to take my stack of plates to the farthest table first because it makes it easy for other people. And it makes it easy if I'm doing it by myself, then it makes it easy for later me who is tired and doesn't want to carry plates anymore. Um, so whether it's for yourself or for others, that's a great way to be an awesome coworker. Oliver. Okay. Uh, just be on time, especially when it comes to time off because your co can't leave until you're back. If that's the case. Yeah. Um, and also if they're not going on their time off, you're still that reprieve. So be on time. Also, same thing for activities, be on time. If you're coming back to the group, be there. Don't take too much time. If you are, say, going to do one of those extra little small tasks that you're doing to make your campus have a better time, don't waste time doing nothing during that because you're taking a break from your campers or a break from a situation that demands your presence. And that means your co is working really hard. So don't waste time there. Be on time getting back to them as well. So good. Yeah. A, a lot of, I think a lot of this is like, just do your job well, right. As a, as a, a counselor, as a staff member, just do your job well. And one of those things is, is we don't want to make more work for other people. So I, I'm referenced this in a past episode, but I want to read out this, this unwritten rules of leadership um, to you because I think they're so great. And, and every single one will make less work for others. Ready? So if you open something, close it up. If you unlock something, lock it. If you break something, try to fix it. If you use it, take care of it. If you can't fix it, find somebody who can. If you make a mess, clean it up. If you move it, put it back. If you borrow it, return it. If you can improve something, do it. If it belongs to someone else and you want to use it, ask permission. If it does not concern you, mind your own business. I think that's awesome. So yeah. And a lot of that is just doing your job, but I hate getting somewhere and even a super cool thing. If there's like confetti all over the ground or like whipped cream or whatever left out, that's like, then I have to spend more time, spend less time doing cool stuff with my kids. Cause I'm cleaning up after your mess. Uh, buy in. We talk about this all the time, but accept the change or the activity or whatever it might be and assist others with having a great time with it too buy into it a lot that helps the person who is trying to make it happen it helps other people buy in as well because they may not be willing to take that first step i know that i we just started our facebook group for our staff and one of the things i ask is can you post your story can you post about yourself on there and one of the first things that I'm looking for is who are those first people who are posting their stories? Who are the first people who are willing to step up? Because um, mm. I want to I see who's willing to take that first step. It's uh, such a great thing to see. And then you notice as soon as one, two, three people do it, everybody else starts to buy in and starts to get that train rolling. It's really important to be that person. And if you're a good co, you're helping because then the campers buy into the activity and it just works out so much better. Buy in. Mm -hmm. That's great. And my, my last tip here was kind of a, a similar was just like volunteer for things. Being the first person to put your hand up um, is like really helpful as a, a camp director. I, I might've even said this on a past episode before, but like when you ask someone to do a job and someone just raises their hand, that's like the best present you could ever give a director. And what I would also say is that you don't always have to be the first. We don't want you to burn yourself out by trying to be super counselor. Um, a trick that one of my friends uh, said when it comes to like teaching people to take initiative is that he just waits three seconds. He counts to three, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, and then raises his hand, which I thought was kind of cool because then you're still volunteering and helping, but you're giving other people a chance to do it as well. And, and that gives other people a chance to grow, which is also a way to be a good coworker. Yeah. I like that idea too, because it also hits a point, a little bit that I want to say is don't be invincible. Don't be the 
co who's taking care of everything and leaving nothing for your coworker to handle. Mm -hmm. A, you're going to burn out really quickly, but B, also you're not showing them any trust to do things on their own. They're not going to become more capable. And then when you're burnt out, they're not going to be able to handle the things that you've been handling this whole time. So don't be the invincible counselor. Be a counselor who's going to work together. And with that being said, the last thing that I want to hit on is know what your role is and kind of accept it, right? Mm. I talked about how there's quantitative people and qualitative people. There's different people's on the Meyer Briggs scale, the True Color scale. There's different ways to show affection. Your co is not going to be the same person as you. They're not going to be your best friend for sure. Um, maybe some directors would do that, but I know that I don't put best friends typically together because they get distracted and they can't focus on just their campers. <laughs> but <clears throat> It's really important to realize that, A, you've been put with that person for a reason. It's because you're different. And the kids who are in your cabin are different. They come from all different walks of life. There's no kid who's going to be, there's no cabin that's going to be all quantitative kids. There's no cabin that's all going to be the color blue, if you know true colors. There's no kids, there's no cabin that's going to be all ENTJs. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> so we put counselors who are inherently somewhat different in a cabin because Campers need someone to look up to. They need a role model who's a little bit like them that they can start to mimic. So it's okay if you are fitting into a role in your cabin. If you are being the person who's sometimes a little bit more strict or sometimes a little bit more fun, it's okay. There needs to be a balance, of course. Don't have one person do it, but don't freak out if you're being a little bit more um, of this role, if you're playing this part, because it lets campers connect with somebody and then they can work off of it. And they can grow because they have a role model. Matt? Yeah. I, I, the last thing I want to say with this is we've talked a lot about like your personality types and love languages. And, and one thing I just wanted to emphasize is that your personality type, whether you're quantitative, qualitative, a blue ENFP, that doesn't excuse your behavior right? You can't say, well, I'm this person, so therefore I'm not going to care about your emotions. And that's just who I am. At the end of the day, no, it's your job to change kids' lives and we do whatever we need to do and be whoever we need to be to do that. And at the end of the day, sometimes that might be going against your natural inclinations. Um, and especially in the spirit of being a go good coworker, if you, you would want them to be flexible, so you need to be flexible as well. Yeah, it's that adaptability that we talked about at the beginning of the show. And this, for a lot of you, might be your first job that you ever have. And you're going to learn that your job here at camp and your job in the future is not going to let you just fit into a box that you want to fit in. You have to adapt, you have to be flexible, and you have to work within the realms that are expected of you. All right. That is our show about how to be a great co. I hope you become a great co this summer and a fantastic first class counselor. But it is time to get ready so you can do just that. So Matt, what would you do right now to get ready for summer? Yeah, so one thing that we've talked about love languages, and I know that we, I think we've probably said the word love languages, including that one about 100 times in, in our series, um, but discover your own. I'm going to throw a link in the show notes uh, for you to take a quick quiz that um, is based on the book, The Five Languages of Love, and uh, you'll discover it. And then the cool thing about love languages, I think Oliver mentioned that it's, um, it's, it's how people like to get love. It's also how people give love, too. Um, and one of the cool little hacks to it is that you give the love language that you like to get as well. So when you start to understand that, I think it's a great book to read if you have some time right now, um, good thing to read. Um, but when you know that, it really changes the way you look at how you can support other people, um, which is really cool. Yep. All right. And for mine, uh, I know a lot of people are at home during this time of the year. So <laughs> if you're chilling there and watching some Netflix, a great program you can tune into is a show called 100 Humans. Um, I do want to say it is a great show. It is very, very entertaining. Uh, their experiments, I will say, as somebody who is quantitative, uh, <laughs> sometimes lack a little bit of, um, how you can say, uh, controlled environments. But at the end of the day, a lot of the things that they talk about in their show are based off of true scientific fact. And they are giving you a clear visual on how some of those things can be seen in our world. So some of them are a little bit strange. They might talk about that fantastic question you may have asked at camp. And if you haven't, it's a great conversation starter about how do you wipe 
when you go poo. Um, <laughs> and they analyze that type of study by looking at 100 people and how they do it. Um, not like while they do it, they kind of ask them and they <laughs> display it. Um, but <clears throat> it may cover something like that, but it also might cover something that I think is really important. There's one section that they do about positive and negative reinforcement when they're spinning some plates. And you can learn about how important positive uh, reinforcement is in order to make sur sure somebody can improve on or master a skill. So it's a great show. It's very entertaining uh, to watch. Uh, I do give it the small asterisks of how they go about doing their studies. But again, I'll say they are based off of scientific fact. Uh, so with that being said, those are our get readies. Matt, can you tell me how to get a hold of you if we have any questions after the show? Well, Oliver, uh, you can either send me an email at matt at gocamp Dot pro, or you can find me on Instagram where I would be happy to uh, field any questions that you have from the show, or if you have any topic for um, future shows and want to suggest them to us, that's how we have done some of our favorite episodes here. So please feel free to send those on to me. How about you, Oliver? Uh, to get a hold of me, you can just simply use my email, oliver.gregan at ghymca.org. Uh, you can also hit me up on Facebook Messenger. It is a great way to get a hold of me and I'll answer any questions you have or uh, talk to you about any campy thing that you're looking into. Uh, so with that being said, if you enjoyed today's show, we'd be so grateful if you could leave us a review wherever you are listening to this podcast. Your ratings and reviews not only help us know what you like about the show, but also what you might not like about the show so we can improve. But it also helps boost our ratings and helps more people discover the show. With that being said, tell somebody, uh, share our show with other people. The whole point of our show is that a camp director can give this to their counselor, but also a counselor can give it to counselors. Co's can give it to co's. Show off our show so that everyone can improve. And like we talked about today, communication is key. So if you listen to the show and your co listens to the show, you guys are already off to the same page, which means you're getting ready for summer in the right way. Oh yeah. If you knew who you were working with and you like, make sure it's not passive aggressive. Like you're sending that, but like, yo, we could be the best coworkers ever. Let's listen to this podcast. That would be sweet. Um, it, I would also say is you can send your friend along with this episode, send them to the show notes, which you can find at camphacker.tv slash podcast, um, where you'll find love languages. Um, you'll find the leadership poem that I keep talking about over and over. Um, and just some other helpful links and information about this episode. Yeah. Uh, you'll also be able to find the Make My Day book copy that you can find, which I've actually found out. Uh, we got it from Camp Misty Mountain. They left it on the Summer Camp Professional page, and we have been using it here at Camp Jewel now. So thank nice. you very much, Camp Misty Mountain. Uh, and with that being said, thanks for listening, friends. And remember, camp is camp, and camp's all good. Mm -hmm.